I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His and have riches untold. I'd rather. If you have the Word of God, open up to the Book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms and Psalm number 3 is where we'll find our text tonight. Psalm number 3 is where we will find our text. As you're turning there, I want to give you the context of this passage of Scripture. King David, he's in a, horror, he's in a bad situation, we could say it. Worldly speaking, the world looks at him and says he has no help and he has no hope. Psalm number 3, we find David running from his son Absalom. And as you're turning there, I just want to read a few verses that will give the context of the setting of what is happening here. Second Samuel chapter number 15 reads, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, Abs Absalom being David's son, prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thou servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, and there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And we see here, verse number 6, at the end of the verse, it says, So Absalom stole the hearts 
of the men of Israel. And later in verse number 13, a messenger comes to David and says, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. King David, he's been run from his throne. King David, he's in a bad situation. The whole kingdom is coming out to seek to kill him. Absalom, he comes to the courts and he starts telling people that if I was made king, you would have justice. If I was king, it would be different for you and your family. If I was king, such and such would happen. It, to me, I believe Absalom sounds like a modern day politician making all these promises that couldn't be made true. But Absalom, he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And we find David, he's running for his life. David, he's in the wilderness. He doesn't know what to do. And we find him here in Psalm 3. David cries out to God in Psalm 3, verse number 1, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. Worldly speaking, David had no help. Worldly speaking, David had no hope. The world surrounded him and said, David, you're done for. David, your life is over. I believe many times we've been in helpless situations, it seems. Worldly speaking, we felt like we've been in some helpless situations. We've gone through life, and if you haven't been through a helpless situation, maybe you're in one now, or you'll go through one. The world says we have no hope. That's what they told David here. We find, first of all, in this passage of Scripture, in verse number 1 and 2, the enemies. We find the enemies. Look again. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. We see in verse number 1, David's enemy is many. He says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Yeah. David saying, oh Lord, how are there so many? I believe every time David turned around or he peeked his head around the corner, there was another enemy coming for him. Five more around the corner, ten over the hill, a hundred, whatever it might be. His enemy is very many. Not only is his enemy very many, but we see in verse number two, many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. His enemy was very malicious. His enemy was many and it was malicious. They showed great malice towards King David. They said, David, you're done. You have no hope. You have no help. You might as well just surrender. You've been run from the kingdom. You've been run from your throne, from your house. Everything's been taken away from you, David. Why don't you just surrender now? They said, you have no help. You have no hope. And as I studied this passage of Scripture, I started thinking about how David's enemy is just like our enemy. If you study through the life of David, David faced the same enemies that we face today. You may say, we, we, we don't have an Absalom. We don't have our son trying to kill us. But David faced three enemies. You can study his whole life and find out that David had three enemies his whole life. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Right, it's the same three enemies that we face in our life. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. Study the life of David. Everything that happens to him in his life is those three things. We know that the world is always at constant odds against us. It doesn't want to serve in the Lord. We know that the devil walks around as a roaring lion, seek, lion seeking whom he may devour. We know in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. Our enemy, our enemy is very many. Our enemy is very malicious. And the three enemies that we have, the world, the flesh, and the devil, know how to get to us. Through the pride of life. I mean, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Everywhere that we go, I was thinking earlier, or even on my way to Florida the last few days, as I was driving from West Virginia, I'd be driving down the interstate, and I'd look out ahead of me, and I'd see a billboard with a picture of something I wouldn't want to see. I'd keep driving, and a few miles later, I'd look over on a car, words or something written on a car, that, uh, bumper stickers that I didn't want to see. We can't go anywhere anymore without the enemy trying to attack us. I was at the motel earlier, and I walked through the parking lot, walked over to the gas station, just get out to enjoy the nice weather. It's been freezing cold in West Virginia, so I want to try to enjoy a little bit of this weather while I'm here. So I went for a walk, and I went to the gas station, just got a drink, and walked back. And... As soon as I walked in the gas station, I opened up the doors and there's a big cooler in the middle with a bunch of alcohol there. Our dear brother, he was preaching this morning or teaching in Proverbs about alcohol. You can't go anywhere with a family anymore, any restaurant, without seeing people drinking alcohol. Even a preacher's favorite cracker barrel has started serving alcohol too. Anywhere that you go. As I lived in Montana at the beginning of this last year, I would go to Walmart as soon as I get out of the van to walk into the store, I'd hear music, music that I don't want to hear, music that doesn't uplift the Lord. As soon as I got out of the vehicle, that's all I could hear was the music coming outside, of, not even inside the store, but outside of the store. I'd walk in the store, I'd still hear the same music. I lived in Virginia this summer, and it was exactly the same. I'd call my dad normally while I was out. 
and I'd be shopping at Walmart. He couldn't even understand me most of the time because the music was so loud in the Walmart. The same with Knoxville. I don't know how it is here, but I believe it would be the same here as well. Everywhere that we go, we're always, at a, we're always under attack. Because our enemy, it's many, just as David's was. Our enemy, it's very malicious, just yeah. as David's was. Yeah. The world, the flesh, and the devil, it has nothing good to offer us. Amen. As I said, it knows about the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. You know, many times in our life, we'll just be living our life, and every time that we go anywhere, we get attacked from one of those three things. We live in a wicked world. We live in a vile world. But as I was studying this, I came across a word there at the end of verse number 2. David says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. And then David says one word there at the end, Selah. I'm so thankful for that, Psalm, that Psalm 3 doesn't end up to verse number 2. I'm so thankful that the enemy doesn't win. We'll continue on to see that there's victory over the enemy. So thankful that Psalm, two, that Psalm 3 doesn't end after verse number 2. David says Selah right there at the end, and that word Selah means to pause for contemplation. I don't know how long it is in time period before, between verse number 2 and verse number 3. But I just see David as he's sitting there. The enemy around him, he's been run from his kingdom. His son's trying to kill him to take over the throne. And I just see David sitting there writing, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. And I just see David sitting there under all this pressure, under all the weight of the wickedness of the world around him. I just see David take a deep breath. And I just see David pause for just a minute. And then he breaks out into Psalm in verse number 3. He says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I await for the Lord sustain me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. You see, the world looked at David and said, David, you're helpless. David, you're hopeless. David, your life is over. And David, for a minute, I believe David started to believe him. But then he paused for a second and he remembered that God was with him. David remembered that there is hope in a hopeless time. We looked at the world around us. We looked at the wickedness, the vileness around us. And we can remember that God still gives hope because He is a God of hope. Amen. As long as we have breath, we have hope because Amen. there's a God that gives us hope. Amen. As I said, we can look around the world at the wickedness, at the vileness. There's so much wickedness going on. But David, in this wicked time that he lived in, all the malice that was given towards him, all the great enemy that was against him, he looked to God for encouragement. First, we saw the enemy. Secondly, we see the encouragement in this passage of Scripture. We, find, we see that David found encouragement. David busts out in the psalm and says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Amen. A shield, that means we can find protection in the Lord. If you study through the psalms, each psalmist often will refer to God being a shield to them. God is their protection. God watches over them. God helps them. It's a popular theme throughout the psalms of God being our shield. David had confidence that he could find protection in God. David knew that even though he might have been run off his throne and from his kingdom, that God was still on His throne in His kingdom and was still in control. Amen. We can find encouragement in times of help, helplessness and hopelessness. Look with me, if you would, in Psalm 90. Psalm 90, it's a prayer of Moses. Psalm 90 in verse number 1. With the thought of God being our protection, God being our shield, as David said, but Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. God's our shield, our protection. Moses says in Psalm 90 and verse number 1, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. We can dwell and find safety in the Lord. We can dwell and find peace in the Lord. In times of hopelessness, we can dwell in God. Why? Because God has been our dwelling place for all generations. My former pastor, Pastor Sam, he was, God was his dwelling place. My parents, God was their dwelling place. From generation to generation, we can find hope in God. We can find Dwell, we can dwell in God. Look at verse or Psalm number 91 just across the page. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy butler and butler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor 
for the arrow that flieth by day. I love these verses I have underlined in verse number 2, in Him will I trust. Amen. In times of difficulties, in time, and the, when the world looks at me and says I'm helpless and I'm hopeless, I can trust in God. What's the result when I trust in God? We'll look at verse number 3. Surely He will deliver me. We must trust the Lord to deliver us. What's the result? What are we doing when we trust in God to deliver us? Look at verse number 4. He shall cover thee with His feathers. When we trust in God to deliver us, He'll cover us. And in verse number 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. Look at Psalm number 92, verse number 10. Uh, Psalm number 92, verse number 15. To show that the Lord is upright, He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. Flip the page to Psalm 94 and verse number 22. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. That word, it was popular there in Psalm 91 that we just looked at in Psalm 92. But I have it underlined, I have it circled here in my Bible, and I have it written next to it. He's a personal God. In times of hopelessness, we can go to a God of hope. Why? Because He's personal to us. The Bible says right here, but the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. I'm so thankful that we can find protection in God. We can find encouragement. We can find hope in God. If you go back to Psalm number 3, we'll continue through the third verse. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. You know, the enemy seems to prevail. The wickedness seems to be rampant all around us. And it's easy for us to hang our head low. It's easy for us to get discouraged. The head in time of trouble, sorrow, and danger is naturally bowed. It's naturally hung low just due to the weight and the pressure. But the Bible says here, David says, and the lifter up of my head. My glory in the lifter up of mine head. David saying these times he can look to God to uplift his head. Amen. Many years ago there was a basketball game. I remember I was watching it. And I've watched the highlight of this. I couldn't say how many times since. And I believe it was Oregon and UCLA playing. It was a college game. It was one of those basketball games that was going to come down to the wire. Like the last possession was going to win. And I believe it was an Oregon player. He dribbled down the court and he stopped. And he turned around to pass it to his point guard that just crossed half court. And he threw it behind him, threw the ball out of bounds. Ultimately, it was going to cost his team the game. He was disappointed in himself. He started running down the court with his head hung low. They had the camera on him. Everybody was looking at him. And his teammate ran up behind him. While his head was low, his teammate ran behind him, grabbed his chin, and just lifted it up and tapped him on the back of the head and kept going. And every time I see that video, I, it surfaces every once in a while that I'll see it. I'm reminded that's what God is to us. In the times of our hope, in, time, in hopeless times, we have our head hung low. When we don't know where to go, when we don't know where to look, when we're discouraged, God will just come back by, by us, grab our chin, and lift us up and remind us everything's going to be okay. Amen. I'm so thankful that we can find hope in hopeless times. We may be down, but He will lift us back up. Amen. Verse number four I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and He heard me out of His holy hill. See, I'm so thankful that we can cry aloud to God in these hopeless times. The God that gives hope, the Creator God of the universe, we can cry aloud to Him and He will hear us. I think of a man named Jonah. If you'd turn with me to the book of Jonah, we'll look at something real quick. We all know the story of Jonah. God says, Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah arises and goes the opposite direction. Jonah, he didn't want to follow the Lord. That's not what he wanted with his life. Jonah chapter number 1, verse number 3, it speaks about how Jonah went to the shipyard and he paid the fare thereof and went down into the ship. And as I read, read that, I'm reminded that when you run from the Lord and we're living a life of sin, it, there will always be a payment for it. Yeah. As it said for Jonah, he was running from the Lord, he paid the fare. And it says, and he went down. And when you're not following the Lord, you're always going down, you're never going up. Right. Yeah. But we know the story of Jonah. Jonah. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah arose and went the other direction. He's on this ship. And the waves starting to... The Lord sent a great storm. And in the middle of the storm, they found out that Jonah was the reason for it. They cast him overboard and he was swallowed by a great fish. And that's where we find Jonah in Jonah chapter number 2. The Bible says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction and unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. As I read that, I started thinking about how Jonah, he's spiritually lower than he's ever been in his life. He's at an all-time low of his life. I also think about how there's no such thing as a submarine or anything like that, so Jonah's more phys physically lower than any man has ever been before. He's at an all-time physical low, all-time spiritual low, but he cried unto God. And what does the Bible say? Amen. 
the end of verse number two. And thou heardest my voice. Amen. I'm so thankful. In these times when it seems there's no hope in the world, we have a God that cares, that will listen to our every cry. Amen. I love to think about it. It's the creator God of the universe. How great is that? Walk outside tonight and look up into the night sky. Look to the moon. Look to the stars if you can. And just think, the same God that created that, the same God that holds the whole universe in His hand, we have direct access to. Whenever we want, we can go to Him in prayer. What a joy that is. What encouragement that is in these hopeless times. The, the world looks at us, we have no hope. The world will even say we have no hope. But we can find encouragement in God. Keep looking as we continue through here. Verse number 5, I laid me down and slept, and I awaked. I laid me down and slept, I awaked. For the Lord sustained me. Oh, David's driven from the capital, from his throne and from his home. David's life is not going too well at this moment of his life. He's forced as a fugitive, pursued by thousands for his head. He was made an exile, being sought to be put to death by his own son. His son was soldiers that have been tested and proven in war. People who have seen the heat of the battle and prevailed in it. They're after David. David, he's in a hopeless place. They could come upon him at any moment. But what does David say? David doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that David worried, that David fret. No, look at verse number six, or I mean verse number five. I laid me down and slept. I wait for the Lord sustain me. Everything going on around him. What did David do? David found rest in God. If we want to make it through these hopeless times, if we want to find, if we want to make it through these hopeless times, we must find rest in God. David, he slept, he rested, he waited, and, he, and God sustained him. What is the result when we rest in the Lord? God will sustain us. We see that there. David, he found rest in God, and the Bible says, for the Lord sustained me. I think about old Elijah. He ran for his life in 1 Kings chapter number 19. He was depressed, he was distraught, he was wanting to get away because the queen said that she was going to kill him. And he goes a day's journey, he's distraught and distressed. Everything's going wrong in his life, or so he thinks. He thinks he's the only one serving God. Everything, he's, thrown, he's having a pity party. And he starts to rest, and he finds rest in God. What does God do? God supplies his needs. God strengthens him to go on his journey. We can find rest in God. God will sustain us. God will strengthen us. God will supply us with everything that we need. And it will be in his timing. As we continue on through here, look at verse number 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Oh, just a few verses earlier, David saying, Lord, how? God, there's so many of them, I don't understand. There's, every time I turn around, there's more. But now David's saying, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Amen. At first, he was afraid of everything going on around him, but now he looks at it and says, Lord, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. Amen. David found hope. David found peace in God. David says, I know my chances, I know my odds, but I won't let that put me in fear. David's saying, despite how the world views me, despite what the world says of me, I'm not going to let that stop. I'm not going to let that waver me. David's saying, in spite of the world being against him, he's going to put his faith and his hope and trust in God. When we look around us, we live what the world will say is in a hopeless world. But we serve a God that gives hope. We can find hope in hopeless times. If we continue on, we'll come to our last point in verse number 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for Thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon Thy people. Amen. See, look, first of all, we saw the enemy. We find the encouragement. And lastly, we find the emancipation. Emancipation, it means the freeing of someone from slavery. David finds freedom in God. And we can find freedom in God. David says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for Thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. David went and found comfort in the past deliverances that God had given him. We can find comfort and assurance in present troubles from the recollection of what God has done for us in times past. I believe each and every single one of us, we can take the rest of tonight, one by one, come up here and talk about how God has never failed us. God's never let us down. And we can remember that in these times of our life that God's never failed us. We can go back and remember what God has done for us. David, he had confidence from past deliverances. I'm sure David's thinking about the bear and the lion that God saved him from. Or David's imagining as 
he is hiding for his life right now about him standing in front of Goliath. God delivered him from the giant. I also believe David could have thought about King Saul. King Saul came to try to kill him. David's run for his life then too. But God delivered him. We can find hope in past deliverances that God will be with us still. We can find hope in hopeless times. Verse number 8, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. See the Our hope comes from the Lord. We can't save ourselves. We're hopelessly lost without God. David has no expectations to save himself here. Nowhere in this passage could you try to say that David was looking to himself for hope. David ultimately said, hope comes only from the Lord. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. If we want to make it through this hopeless time, we can find hope in God. David knows that if he's going to be saved, it's going to be by God and by God alone. And I'm so encouraged to know that the same God that saved David in his trials is the same God that we serve today. Amen, He's the same yesterday, yesterday today, and forever. Amen, amen. He's never changing. In these hopeless times, what do we need to do? I believe Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 2 tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. In this time, in this world, in this wickedness going on around us, we can look to Jesus, for He is our hope. Each and every single one of us, we all go through so many difficulties, so many trials, storms of life even if you want to call it. But we can find hope. We can find a refuge. We can find a dwelling place in God. We can look at David as a man that found hope in God. He looked to God for encouragement. He found emancipation. He found freedom, salvation from God. The same God that delivered David is the same God that will deliver us. I believe it's really interesting if you study through the life of David and when he wrote these psalms and what psalms he wrote. If you looked at a few years later in David's life, right before he died, right a few years after this takes place, he penned another psalm. I believe it's one of the most popular psalms that we know of, Psalm 23. David, in this life, in this time of his life, he says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? But later in his life, he says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David went from earlier in his life saying, Lord, how are they increased? God, there's so many of them. They're so great. They're so wicked against me, dear Lord. I don't understand. I don't know why. But David found hope in God. Because God is the only one that can give hope. We see that at the end. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. God is the only one that can save us. Later in David's life, he was able to say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And I want to encourage you in this hopeless time that the world says we live in, we can look to God for hope. Amen. Pastor Sam, he was preaching this morning, and he mentioned a little bit of his testimony. He even said it this way. He said, the world told him he had no hope. The world said that he would die with a bottle in his mouth. They said he had no hope. He had no help. Nothing could help him. Nothing could save him. But then he met Jesus, and Jesus saved him. Jesus gave him hope. We can find hope in a hopeless time. Amen. I'll end with this illustration. Just a few nights ago, I was... At home, I believe it it was about six days ago on Monday night. My father had just left for work. My mom was in bed. She was getting ready for work the next morning. My sister and I, we were sitting in the living room. We had an NFL game on, and I wasn't really watching. I was reading. She was on her phone. We just kind of had it on for background noise. And I looked up to see the store, and it was on commercial, so I just didn't think anything of it. About three or four minutes later, I look up, and still, lo and behold, it's on commercial. So I was like, okay, there's something weird. And then they came on there and they started talking about DeMar Hamlin, how he made just a normal routine tackle, stood up and dropped. And they did CPR on him for nine minutes, had to resuscitate him on the field, brought him to the hospital, had to resuscitate him there. And as I watched that scene, as I watched, as I kept going back to the stadium, showing fans, showing players, grown men on their knees weeping. They fell on their knees weeping and crying. All that the announcers could say, they would go away to another location and they would say, pray for Damar. Pray for Damar. And for a few days over social media, all that you would see, pray for Damar. Pray for three. Pray for Hamlin. Anything and everything like that. Even a day or two after that, 
A man on ESPN came out and he publicly prayed on national TV, bowed his head and prayed to God for DeMar Hamlin. And as I sat there and as I've looked at all this stuff going on with him this week, I started thinking about this. That even these people, I don't know if they're saved or not. The lifestyle they live leads me to believe that they're not, but that's between them and the Lord. But these people of the world, everyone around us, in times of tragedy, they know that there is only one hope. And that hope is God. In that time when it was a matter of life or death, football didn't mean anything. That big playoff implication game meant nothing anymore. They realized that there's only one thing, one person that can give hope in hopeless times and a hopeless situation. As I said this whole week, people have been saying, pray for tomorrow, pray for tomorrow. Why? Because even they, they realize and they acknowledge that we only have one hope in this world. That hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He gives hope. Thank you.